If political antagonisms are prone to being misplaced and displaced in common institutional life such that they mirror a strained Oedipal dynamic of the family, then personalized aggressions become the common form of political exchange in political discourse. This leads to dynamics within liberal political culture to where even anarchist energies of revolt and insurrection tend to secretly submit to this problematic. In a system dominated by the liberal Oedipal problematic, arrangements of hierarchy and status quo relations are often kept in place, even after acting out against authority occurs. Our era is marked by the resurgence of the political, and with that resurgence we see new figures of contestation. New movements of solidarity and class struggle are emerging, and they aim to contest the social order. The very roots of evil, of negativity and singularity. Including the ultimate form of security, which is how can change the whole state of things in pure violence without object and form. This is a typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens then is a murder of the real. The vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to the Machine of Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins, as always sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we get started with today's guest, consider tossing us a buck a month at www.patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H, or you know, consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Also, be sure to follow us on our YouTube account, subscribe, and uh, if, if, if that's one of the ways in which you uh, get your podcasts, you know, subscribe on there. We're trying to get more content out all the time. Uh, but today's guest, we have Daniel Tut. He's back with us today. Uh, longtime listeners of the show may remember that he helped us discuss uh, what the first couple of sections of Chapter 3 of Anti-Oedipus. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll link that in the show notes as well. Yeah, and link that in the show notes. And he's got a new book that's out in the Paul Grave Lacan series called Psychoanalysis and the Politics of the Family, The Crisis of Initiation. Daniel, thanks again for coming back on the show. I don't know if either of you have a place that you'd want to start. I might throw it in, in one of your courts to start off, perhaps, mm-hmm. just because I'm a little bit. I like that you have a, a nice little glossary at the end of the book which I should have looked at before, (laughs) (laughs) but coming back to it, you know, looking at it in preparation for our talk today, I wanted to uh, bring up something like the social superego, which you you define very concisely. And you want to say a little bit about the social superego as a concept? Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks for finding some value in the glossary. It actually was somebody on Twitter who's like, I kind of like a dare, like I dare you to write a theory book and put a glossary of concepts. It's good. And it, yeah, it's kind of rare. It is good. I mean, because I try to repeat the concepts and I also try to incorporate the concepts into domains where and to bring them into conversation with other concepts from yeah. other thinkers. And you notice that they kind of have a certain logic. Of, they repeat, they come back over and over. And so the social superego for me is a very important one. It actually is tracked in Freud, in Freud's group psychology. You have Mm -hmm. reference to the social dimension of the superego. You also have reference to what's called the collective superego. And in a way, it's a distinction from the the site of superego formation that the family creates. It's different than that. It is kind of what binds a wider libidinal cathexis beyond merely the family. And in a way, it has some resonance with Lacan's notion of the big other. Although yeah. I don't I don't really track that fully in part because I will confess I'm not a huge admirer of the concept of the big <laughs> other. That's something else we can dis- discuss. But the reason that I like social superego as a kind of as a kind of uh, way of thinking about a certain period because for historical reasons. And what I mean by that is that you know I felt like it's important to situate our time in the mode of production that we live in in all of its kind of specificity to the best extent that we can. In other words, what can we speak of as a kind of set of common psychic conditions, common psychic binds that we are, that we are succumbed to, that we are subject to? 
what makes up the kind of common repertoire of superegoic mechanisms that animate our era. Now, Lash in Culture of Narcissism develops and refines this notion of social superego to refer basically to the weakening of the familial superego right. and the kind of concurrent predominance of a more sensorial, more vicious, socialized form of superego. He locates that as a kind of disintegration of the Fordist capitalist period. He locates that in the rise of and in the disintegration, of course, of the family, of the nuclear family, which we can talk about all of the kind of, you know, because psychoanalysis had a huge role to play in the stabilization and in the preservation and, in fact, the relay system of the family back to something like the kind of normalization of subjectivity. And by that, I mean the family was responsible for the preparation of subjects to enter the workforce, right? Mm -hmm. And so the whole theory of Oedipus had a kind of very pragmatic role in the schema of wage labor. In the 1970s, that kind of disintegrates in a certain sense, like that kind of implicit Fordist social contract of the family begins to fray at the edges. No longer do families have the same wherewithal super egoically. They lose a certain efficacy of super ego formation. And in that sense, families become sites of a greater psychosis. And so you see this, or, or if you like, not merely psychosis, but a proliferation of a kind of unhinged narcissistic potential. In other words, one of the things the family cannot secure as well as it used to is the production of a kind of, I don't know, planned subjectivity, a kind of, they lose the capacity for social reproductive control. The family becomes depoliticized. Its agency, not only the father, but the family unit as such, as a kind of vector of the state, becomes depoliticized. And Lash was concerned with the way that this other social mode of authority, what he calls social superego, intervenes in that space, right? And so Lash develops a whole kind of, I think, useful way of thinking that through. I think there's, and you, you saw this also in my uh, chapter three, where I turned to Kojin Karatani, because Karatani, you know, the Japanese Marxist philosopher in his book on Freud, develops a beautiful dialectic between death drive and superego. And he theorizes something very, very similar to Lash, apropos this periodization of superego. What he says is basically that in conditions of consumer capitalism, you can also use the phrase finance capitalism or mm -hmm. post-Fordism, the society actually functions on a superego-less basis. And so what you end up having is a kind of logic of social stabilization. Karatani puts a huge onus on the depoliticization of consumer capitalism, right? And in a way, what I like about what Karatani does is he says, look, we shouldn't be necessarily afraid of theorizing superego, especially in our era, because in a way, every political crisis, every moment of uprising, insurrection, a political event, a left-wing formation, what Deleuze and Guattari might call a group sickle, must contend with their own superego formation. And in that sense, the superego, while it has, we have this kind of acephalic social superego, and of course, Lacan also theorizes something very close to this periodization in his notion of the superego demand to enjoy, right? So I'm kind of trying to find a, a series of psychoanalytic theorists who are all saying something quite similar about the era of consumer capitalism and the superego deprivation that we're facing. Concurrent to the fact that also... There are emergences of superego, and we need to actually like, kind of, I know, you know, take them more seriously in a way. Like we, especially for the left, I think, need to have a kind of awareness of what superegoic mechanisms, how they, what form they take, and um, how we might get ahead of their logics, such that we don't. And you know, of course, in the conclusion, I invoke Mark Fisher, who was very, very concerned about this on the left, and I think he was kind of trying to be a man of unity on the left. And we can talk about some of those super egoic formations that emerge on the left. And I think it's really important that we do so. But long story short, the social superego is a kind of pernicious, there's a lot of danger also in it, I will say, Taylor, in the sense that because it also signifies the decline of the paternal function and the decline of the father's authority. You were talking about this move towards sort of edipalization going through the mother or... Yeah. 
and sort of the absence of the father, which, you know, right. I, I just rewatched the documentary on Bill Cosby. And that was one of his favorite things later in life is kind of, you know, this kind of reactionary Reaganist type of blaming mm. of, of the black family, you know, the father's absence as though that were merely one, you know, racial communities problem when you're, you're saying that this is, this is something identified much more broadly in, I'm, in I'm, liberal. Yes, I'm saying that, but I'm saying something deeper, which is that Lacan argued that the decline of paternal function, of course, still is in decline and loses its efficacy even within a well-functioning bourgeois family. Mm -hmm. That's a key point. I mean, I think we should take a step back and historicize the family if if we could if we could because i i feel like that story is like the essential ingredient here to drive us to this notion of kind of where we're at now because i mean even in policing the family this incredible book by one of the donzalo yeah. by donzalo you know you're familiar with this mm -hmm. you know, he ends that one book. of Foucault's students one of Foucault's students a very important figure he wrote an incredible text uh, called anti-sociology which is one of the most important introductions to anti-oedipus and he also wrote this book, Policing the Family. So I'm going to pull from his stuff, but I'm also going to pull from Eli Zaretsky, who is a kind of Marxist American psychoanalytic historian, and I'll also pull from Christopher Lash. And so the basic story here is that, you know, the, the function of the family emerges after French Revolution as a kind of, let us not repeat the tragic misstep that led to the revolution, which was in a way, the proletarian underclass, those without family, were the vanguard, in a way, of the revolution. So the bourgeois order formulates its own necessary social stabilization, ensuring that the proletarian family doesn't face the same level of radical ostracization, mm -hmm. uh, internal violence, etc., etc., that led to the revolution. So the family is placed, therefore, at the very center of the political order, and it is what unites the right and the left. When you have a compromise in the modern period, politically, it tends to be over the family, which is why the kind of family is interesting to me. Because, um, and you see this all the way up to today. I mean, if you read a book like Melinda Cooper's work on the family, she's very clear that it is the social conservative and the neoliberal pact, the unsaid, the quiet agreement, mm -hmm. always is around the leaning on the family, especially after Thatcher and neoliberalism and so on, to make up for the absence of the welfare state protections. But this has a prehistory. Now, the prehistory that it has plays out very, very interesting because, okay, French Revolution happens, bourgeois order emerges, the conditions of industrialization, the conditions of wage labor end up creating mass proletarianization. So by about 1830s to 1860s, of course, you have 1848 within their mm -hmm. major uprising, the proletarian family is basically at the vanguard of as a kind of revolutionary agency in the sense that actually why ask yourself why this radical demand of Marx and Engels of abolition of the family would be at the front and center of communist manifesto well because and Donzalo makes a beautiful point which is that the bourgeois order did not have a stabilization mechanism to ensure uh, until they invented charity and he says the charitable apparatus became the means by which wayward proletarian subjects, those cast off by their own family, or those families simply that are too poverty stricken to afford to keep up after them, charity would give some reprieve, would give some ground to them, and hence stabilize the social order, right? Now, of course, in the United States, that's very important for the birth of the Republican Party, because at the origin of the birth of the Republican Party was a promise, especially to poor whites, there's a total racial dimension there, mm -hmm. that, and this is one of the, in my opinion, one of the most important myths, uh, political myths of our culture, which is the myth of Horatio Alger, which is that for those discarded by their family, whether they be orphans, whether they be victims of a kind of broken family, whether they be just simply proletarians that need some assurance, not necessarily by the state, but again, by this kind of finance charitable complex, kind of private interests, Algerism would be a kind of mode, highly paternalistic, 
highly paternalistic, in which the Oedipal logic extends itself out to the social order, and you have a kind of unsaid social pact, an unsaid social contract, which would say rich elites have a duty to help hardworking underclassmen. And of course, this is racialized, because underclassmen that are black aren't, aren't included there at this time. That changes, though, over time. So the altruistic mode becomes more racially diverse. But in its origin, and again, it's at the heart of the Republican Party as well, this was one of the stabilization mechanisms to fend off proletarian revolution. So that's that current. Another current that's really useful to track is what Zaretsky calls the birth of subjectivity. It's a beautiful idea, which is that the bourgeois family was formed after the revolution, French Revolution, on the premise that maximization of leisure time should be permitted for, according to the father's dictate. The father has within his wherewithal the right to decide who works, what their career is made of, and who does what, in essence. In fact, there's all of these stories, if you read Balzac, for example, of fathers who would, that were probably like some kind of psychotic individuals who themselves actually ruined their family because it was their whim to do so. Over time, that model became untenable as a replicable model for the proletariat. But Zaretsky shows that at least in form, the proletariat was able to take shards of it, pieces of it, and make something outside of wage labor, make a life outside minimal free time, produced what Zaretsky calls the birth of subjectivity. That then became the basis for a series of political demands, especially of socialist feminists in the late 1800s and into the feminist movement, which really caught off in 20th century and so on, for advocating a new conception of the family that would be beyond the original bourgeois family. There's kind of a, di you see my point, it's a dialectic between proletariat and bourgeoisie that formulates the family. Then you have the emergence of a new formulation of family, which is demanding a greater access to the promise of the bourgeois family, greater leisure time, premised basically in its early trappings on a breadwinner structure. That breadwinner structure isn't really able to be realized until Keynesianism after the war. And even that is fairly limited and it's also racially limited. But that Keynesian model of the breadwinner family formulates, in my opinion, the kind of cultural unconscious. It, it formulates the kind of bedrock of the utopian vision that I think we all share alike. In other words, that golden age Americana, that kind of um, short period from about the you know early 50s up to the mid 70s formulates a kind of fortist pact of a breadwinner family, which I see most political actors in America desperately wishing to somehow <laughs> re-inhabit in some sense, mm -hmm. right? But the other important thing to note there, and Lash, Zaretsky, and Donzelow are huge on this, is that the formulation of that family was deeply reliant on psychoanalysis and on other social science apparatuses and social work apparatuses to formulate a certain logic of subjective normalization. Mm -hmm. So in a way, yes, it was birthed by this kind of late 1900s proletarian upsurge. One of the interesting things, by the way, about that is that it, the demands there were for women because the proletarian woman in the household in the 1900s faced such demanding work, which was absolutely unpaid. And of yeah, course, yeah. the status of unpaid labor still continues today, that the socialist feminist man was to actually enter into the workforce for women as a way of exiting the family so that she could have some autonomy, she could have her own income stream, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then it creates a kind of paradox in the sense that, well, hmm, is a woman entering the field of wage labor actually an achievement of a liberation of freedom? Well, depends on how you look at it, maybe partially. The other interesting thing I'll say here is that, um, and this tracks with a big theme that I kind of look at in the book, is that a lot of the vision that went into the social planning of how to structure the kind of breadwinner family of the Fortis period actually took a big onus or a big emphasis on the importance of adolescence. Adolescence became the kind of high watermark ideal for the ideal of the family. And that contributed, I argue, to a kind of acceleration of a kind of stunted Oedipal dynamic. And in a way, it's an irony because a lot of those insights were afforded by some, maybe you could say, crude readings of psychoanalysis. 
the the idea that adolescence is the period in which you have a kind of free expression. It's a kind of peak of creative. It's a kind of um, it's a very Greek idea as well. And I think that actually, in a weird sense, that has been we can we can discuss this. But this is this is this has been a kind of um, maybe backfired, perhaps. And and I, and I mean that precisely because I think one of the things that concerns me is I feel like we we are facing in our culture a, a crisis over adulthood. Like I, I feel that we are facing some kind of crisis over the transmission and the respect for elders. And of course, me saying that I sound like an old <laughs> traditionalist. <laughs> But I'm interested, actually, in like actually looking at tradition from a different lens. You know what I mean? Like, kind of, how do we? And this is why, like, I'm really interested in thinkers like McIntyre, the Marxist McIntyre, and like, kind of, you know, and even Lash. Maybe tradition isn't actually what we've been told it is. You know what I mean? Like, maybe it's actually time that we actually like rethink some things. Does this make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I'm tracking you. Okay. Oh, no, stop. I've said a lot. Uh, <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. It's a good. I mean, like that obviously sets up nicely the, the background to the book and the impetus for writing the book. You're setting up sort of the, the introductory chapters, specifically chapters one and two, when you do look at this periodization. Psychoanalysis is not always the good guy. I mean, we know that from Deleuze and Guattari this, in, in, in this saga of the family. In what sense are they not the good guy? Well, in a few ways. Number one, psychoanalysis created, if you like, a methodology for producing the what is usually called the happy family, right? And that model of the happy family is something that we haven't been able to shrug off. In a way, it's impossible not to have a happy family. And in fact, if you don't have a happy family, it's a problem. It's a problem for everybody. And that actually is interesting because that's a, you know, a nice definition of a social superego enforcement mechanism right there. But psychoanalysis is a science or sees itself as a science that is able to enter into that ill at ease family, an unhappy family, and propose some change. What's the problem with that? Well, it depends on how you're looking at things. On the one hand, the problem would be that there is a political ideological issue at stake with the family that I want to raise to your attention, which is the fact that in order for a happy family to be happy, there must be a taboo placed on making explicit the fact that the family is also at the heart of social reproduction. In other words, the old bourgeois private family model, you can call it a myth if you like, has to be replicated for all families. Okay? That is an impossible demand. So immediately, like I said before, Lacan can analyze the family, not necessarily from a Marxist class position. He's not interested as much as I am in saying, well, actually, proletarian, bourgeois, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. He's not interested in that, and so, and many writers will say the family qua one class formation. My vision actually it's actually quite interesting because there's all of these kind of paradoxical attachments that proletarian and working class families and families that suffer and struggle form with themselves that actually, in a paradoxical sense, become the, a haven in a heartless world. To use the term of Lash, they become like the only lighthouse, the only refuge. And I think that to speak personally, we've probably all seen that either for ourselves or with others. In other words, we've seen kind of heroic families that weather incredible storms. We've also seen families that harbor profound secrets. And in fact, I would argue one of the interesting things about a family is that at a certain point, there becomes compounded secrets, right? There becomes this repressive dimension to a family, which is why I think that one of the great insights of psychoanalysis is that for a subject, if you like, Oedipus idea refers to the necessity for movement. Now, I think Deleuze and Guattari were clearly aware of this thesis that Oedipus, for them actually really, maybe we could say in general, didn't produce 
uh, <laughs> movement. If anything, it reinforced a certain stasis. Or to the extent that it facilitated movement, it was not necessarily a movement that would necessarily be liberating, because it would always have to reinforce that private bourgeois family edict. So my, one of the questions that I have is that if in the post-1970s family structure, which Donzelo says has no longer become the site for the resolution of discovering a great mystery of your own subjectivity. He says something beautiful, and this actually, I realized this, my thesis of initiation is really tied into this, which is that today, the family is so socialized, it's almost weird in the sense that, you know that taboo on making explicit the fact that the family is like a laboring unit? That like when you get married, you have to marry somebody based on how good of a worker they are, right? Because that's like 90% of what you're doing. It's like working, right? But you don't call, you can't call that work. What you're doing, you can't call that work. Think about that for a second. The fact you can't call that work, okay, means that that logic, what I call the family spirit, picking up on Pierre Bourdieu's notion, is ideological. In what sense? Because you can transplant that to other places and not call that work. So then the family becomes a great concealment mechanism of social reproductive labor itself, which is a quite ingenious thing. And you see it from a Marxist standpoint, why the family is so central. You see my point. So yes, we have to speak personally when we speak about the family and the, the beauty that psychoanalysis opens, despite its complicity with the stabilization mechanism of the family, especially in Europe, not so much in the United States, is that it gives us a way into understanding not only how symptom formations are reliant on the family, but it gives us a way to speak about how the personal is always already political. You know what I mean? Because one of the things that, and I'll stop here, Freud said something beautiful. He said that in childhood, the experience of being a child in a family, if you think about it, even though we have like, you know, Lord of the Flies. But you know, Lord of the Flies, there were no parents when they were on the island and they were revolting. But in a family, if you've had kids, your kids can protest, but they can never revolt. There's no mutiny in a family. Maybe when you're older, you can, you can do a mutiny. But at a certain age, the structure of the family is a structure of pure dependency. And Freud said something very interesting, which I really think is worth retaining, which is that the church and the army become replicated structures of pure dependency. Just as the infant experienced there, the army, ideally, in an ideal sense, will reproduce that dependency. Again, that goes back to the ap apolitical structure of families, on the one hand. On the other hand, it goes back to the notion that Oedipus, that notion of overcoming... Because what is Oedipus here? I would summarize it very maybe too succinctly, if I might, <laughs> is basically that overcoming of these, of that strange, I don't know, period of your life where you have radical dependence. And then in that, you formulate a series of attachments, series of identifications, affective identifications, which are wedged deep into your unconscious, not only to your mother and father, but to their predecessors and to the predecessors that you don't know of before them, such that we could say maybe to be charitable to the Freudian Oedipus notion, the task ahead of us is to work through that so that we have a movement away from it. So you have to have an exit from it, which is why, I mean, to speak personally, I mean, any, anyone that grew up in a, in a fractured family, it's really hard to remain there. You really need to get out. Like it's, the movement is the, the name of the game. And that usually means movement from the hometown you <laughs> are from, at least for me. This is what I would say. Sorry for freestyling here, my friends. I, you know, I have a tendency to do so. That's what we like to do here, so no harm done. I think you're, you're starting to get a feel for where, where I'm coming from, I hope. Yeah, absolutely. Cooper, you said you had a kind of personal... Yeah. Oh, I guess maybe I should do a trigger warning, perhaps for people who have go undergone spousal or like domestic abuse. Although there's not really any physical abuse directly, but I think I, you know, I was telling Taylor one of my earliest memories was my dad having and a, my mother were fighting, and my dad's like brandishing a, a section of a garden hose and like threatening my mother with it. 
I think she wanted to leave or something like that. Mm. And I'm probably like three or four or something like that. And it was this weird, you know, it was very, I was very angry at my father in that moment. Like I was very upset and angry towards my father. And this is kind of one of my like earliest memories that I have, but to contextualize that, I guess I, I don't know. I just feel like maybe my family situation is kind of interesting. and might be a good sounding board to explore some of the arguments that you're making in the book at large, mm-hmm. or maybe even to like, perhaps be a foil in some cases. So I would just go back through my family history of my father graduated high school, I think in five years, my mother dropped out when she was 17, pregnant with me. They got divorced before I could even make a memory, but they still sort of stuck together for a few years after that Mm. until I was probably like in kindergarten. And at one point my mother just, I guess had had enough of my dad and, uh, she was like, Hey, I'm, I'm leaving, you know, I'm going to leave it up to you. You can stay here or you can go with me. And so I made the choice to stay with my father. How, how old were you? How old were you? I mean, like six, seven years old. This was like kindergarten. I love it when you have these families where it's like, um, the child is treated as an adult at a young <laughs> age. That's a very interesting point because the vision of the socialist feminists, as I was saying, was to s- preserve the ideals of adolescence and it's inquisitiveness, its openness to the future, its lack of rigidity, to preserve that as an ideal. But you know, one of the things of the proletarian, say working class family or a family that faces divorce is there's not really that going on. You know, it's actually like everybody, like maybe that seven-year-old has to like decide things that he shouldn't decide until he's 18. And that's normal. Like you need to accept that, right? You see my point? And that kind of goes back to the class thing, because I feel like that's another reason I wrote this book is because I wanted to talk about class, because I feel like in our culture, we don't have the language to talk about class. And I feel like it's healthy to do so. Like, you know what I mean? Like, let's do it. Let's have that conversation. Anyways, sorry, go on. Yeah. And I think that's interesting too. I feel like I have a very interesting class dynamic because my father was like, I said, you know, just a high school graduate never went to college, although he had every opportunity. It's like my grandfather was kind of like inherited all this property and sort of was fairly wealthy for our area based on inheritance from my great grandfather. Right. So, Mm. Mm. but my dad, no, my dad and my uncles are all kind of fail sons basically. But so it's kind of interesting that I have this kind of aristocratic, wealthy grandfather who is a traditionalist and, you know, all of that Mm. that entails, but is like a raging alcoholic. And then I have my father who is kind of a child in his own right in many regards to even to this day. So it's a very interesting dynamic between those are kind of my two fathers, my grandfather and my actual father. My grandfather in particular would undermine my father to me. Like he would talk down on my father around me and it really hurt my feelings, which is bizarre because I have such this like antagonistic, all these antagonistic feelings towards my father just from so many different things like not Mm. only this experience with my mother but like then Mm. you know he remarried my stepmother was like someone who had basically who was like borderline personality type and i was sort of the whipping boy the uh (laughs) the scapegoat so to speak yeah that that relationship yeah which was another interesting kind of dynamic there Mm. so you know that's kind of the (laughs) yeah a little bit about my sort of family background that Mm -hmm. i think would be interesting i don't know if you have questions or follow-ups or would like to di- me to dig into any of that but i thought that might just be yeah interesting very, jumping off points it is a very um american tale in a way i mean it's very melville in the sense that in europe the situation is somewhat more predictable in terms of class essentially but you know the united states has formed in such a way where it's common for that kind of sort of paradoxical like radical divergence of movement. And that's actually one of the things I was interested in. You saw in the conclusion of the book, because I was saying, you know, to the extent that it was like an assertative marriage, like people marrying within the same class as another person in the last 30 years, in this kind of social super ego, you know, consumer capitalism, finance capitalism, whatever dirty word you want to use to call it. One of the things that's interesting apropos the family is that Rich people are marrying rich people, poor people are marrying poor people, and that kind of is a trend. And I think that that's problematic, actually. I really think that's oh, problematic. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, I, I mean, I can go on to my own personal experience as far as, you know, I'm approaching 40. Yeah. I'm not married. I don't mm-hmm. own a home. The prospects of either of those, of having children, I don't have any children. Like, yeah. all of these sort of initiation rights that sort of instantiate one within 
adulthood and our culture are denied, they're foreclosed upon because even with an advanced degree and so forth, I basically work, you know, an entry level job. So all of that is foreclosed. And I'm just this sort of, I call it being a feral adult. Yeah, because it's interesting you say that. I love the motif, the vision of the feral animal on the farm as a way of talking about Oedipus, because one of the themes that I track and, and, you know, honestly, I'm not fully decided on this. Let's just entertain the theory for a second, which is that if, as Donzolo says, kind of that whole structure of the family qua, like Keynesianism, right? Which is like social planning, the state's going to afford something. You can kind of rely on being a carpenter and still being able to have a family. Well, clearly in the last 30 years, that contract has been thrown out the window. In so happening that way, you could theorize subjectivity in those conditions as increasing feralization, right? Which is, if you like, pre edipalization And the quote that I read at the beginning was kind of referencing that in a way, which is like, okay, let's talk about what that means for right. building solidarity, for having rational. I mean, that's actually one of the things I read in Horkheimer. You saw in one of my chapters, I give a quote from Horkheimer. And Horkheimer says something interesting, even though he's a Marxist. He said, the bourgeois family, it's ideal, allowed for the production of a certain way of managing authority that was, you could say, thorough. You could work through it. See my point? You can kind of work through it and overcome it. Now, in conditions of feralization, I worry that part of our struggle is like, we actually don't know where authority starts and ends. We lack these kind of signposts for overcoming Oedipal structures that almost become like deeply entrenched in a certain way. And this is what Donzolo calls the familialization of society. And okay, you could say the familialization of society, you could say in a, maybe it's too jargony, you could say that that is pre-Oedipal structure of society. You could say that. I kind of suggest this. And I kind of want to say, we need to reinterrogate Oedipus then, if that's the case. Like, because we need to, we need to find another way to overcome this stuff. If we talk about the family on the left, there's a portion of the left that doesn't want to talk about the family. There's the social Democrats and they just want to basically kind of be conservative. And they just want to say, yeah, the state needs to strengthen the family at all costs. And you see this like in Nina Power's latest essay, you see this in Compact Magazine, you see this even in Elements of Jacobin. There's another strain of the left from the new left that's trying to revolutionize everyday life, trying to revolutionize the way we talk about gender, talk about family relations, etc. That is trying to, and some of them believe in abolition of the family, okay? Not all of them. But I feel like that impulse is super important because I feel like as a, as a leftist, it's like super important to me to think about revolution from a total sense. What we're facing right now cannot be reduced to the narcissistic demand that everybody have the right to be a private property owner and a family starter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yes, we're, we're given austerity. We're given very little. What are we going to do with that? How are we going to change that situation? What are we going to demand? Are we going to demand the same things? Because if we do that, we're kind of basically saying, make America great again. So it's a real question. It's a real ethical, political question. You know what I mean? You know, I grew up on a cattle ranch, so years past, I probably would have stayed on the cattle ranch and worked the land and yeah. found a little country wife and we'd have continued onward, right? Well, I mean, look, that's the thing is I, I feel like people should have families. I feel like that's actually one of the things I wanted to say in the book, which is, you know, I'm not anti-family. If anything, I think we need to revolutionize the family. I mean, I, I take Baju's proposal, which is... Because this whole business of initiation is interesting. That's kind of the subtitle of my book. Well, okay. In a way, initiation means what? Well, historically, it meant a kind of guarantee of a kind of inclusion. A kind of inclusion qua uh, what? Well, the main, the main side actually was draft into the military. Because draft into the military for boys in the relationship to their fathers resolved the Oedipal thing fully. Because in a way, you have to understand, I think, in the Oedipal drama, there's really two fathers at play. There's the father of the paternal father, which there's a side of overcoming there. 
There's also a social father, which is plural, and which doesn't necessarily take on the father of the home, which is part of the reason why, you know, Batson's notion of the double bind, which is the father presides over the repressive injunction, not necessarily over the sublimatory injunction. The child, let's say the son, must seek out a father of sublimation. In other words, there's a father of no, a prohibit prohibitory father, which is the one that brings you out of the classical Oedipal structure of the kind of suffocation of the mother's desire and introduces you to what Lacan would call language and all of that. That's a kind of constitutive process. To an extent, the social conditions we're facing in families today, that process is stunted to some degree. Broken families, working class families, racialized families, absent father families, that's stunted. What's more interesting to me is the failure of initiation into the second reign of the father, the social father. That is a kind of interesting dynamic. And that is, if you have a strained number one, you're going to have to be creative in inventing a number two. And I think this is a very difficult conversation for us to have. In other words, what does it mean to have a father figure in your life? In a way, the question is unfortunately shameful. People don't like to confess or face up to that fact that we have to find surrogate father figures, which is why, in my view, a lot of surrogate father figures become thrown onto us by chance. They become contingent. And that's actually part of the kind of destiny. And Lacan has so much to say about destiny here. And actually, there is a kind of um, paradoxical um, source of freedom that Lacan noted in this decline of initiatory status of the decline of the paternal function also brought about a kind of new form of luck, a new form of living. It's very American, actually. He would reference America quite a lot there. So in a way, we have two absent fathers. One at home, originary, <laughs> it's kind of defective. And, you know, Paul Claudel is a playwright, a French playwright that Lacan loved and really, really admired. And most of Lacan's theories of name of the father are in dialogue with Claudel's plays. And he wrote, mm. a, he wrote a play called The Humiliation of the Father. Mm. It was a great Catholic reactionary thinker. It's a beautiful playwright, one of the best playwrights of the 20th century. And he had some insights about the crisis of the father function. And you know... For myself, this has just been something that I think that we need to be able to speak about. It's an issue of a kind of um, discourse on fathers without shame. You, does that make sense? Because I feel that in a way, the father always loses today. And in a way, also, we never understand or get a clear grasp of what kind of father we're dealing with. In part because the crisis of the father function is so severe. One of the imaginary repercussions of that is, of course, as you know, the invention of monstrous father figures that haunt us. And I think if anyone's ever been with a woman who's dealt with a monstrous father in their own life, you'll know immediately that the negotiation that you have to play with that individual is that you yourself, as their partner, don't become that monstrous father figure for them. You have to separate yourself from that monstrosity. I speak here from personal experience. And it's true. I mean, there are real monstrous fathers, no doubt. No doubt. We know them flesh and blood. I think the question we have to ask also is, are we willing to reconcile with them or not? I know many people that have done so and seen a kind of um, a true working through. Like if my thesis on Oedipus is like working through is possible, and, and important, let's say, which is something I believe. That could be just for me. I think that there are other conditions or cases in which working through is not going to result in something positive. So I don't want to like universalize that. I think that there are monstrous fathers who are literally monstrous and should not be contended with, right? They need to be let go of, right? And whether you find another father, well, that's fine, whatever. I do think that it's somewhat of an inevitability, even though I think the voice of Felix Quattri is in the back of my head saying all of these problems with this formulation, but and I'd love to know what you think about this, Taylor. But I do think that, I feel like I wrote this book so that we can have these kinds of conversations. You know what I mean? And also, you know, Freud himself 
had a very particular solution to the question of the father apropos politics, which I think is something else we can talk about. Because for Freud, he, in a way, even going back to 1900, interpretation of dreams, there's this incredible dream that Freud recounts. I don't know if y'all are aware of it. It's called a revolutionary dream. You, you mention it. You, you, you um, go through it, I think, in chapter two yeah. or chapter three. You can remind it's, the, the audience. It's, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. It's so cool. I mean, Lacan never mentions it. I don't know why. Freud has a dream. Context of his dream, FYI, is deeply politicized Vienna. Politicized in what sense? Kind of on the cusp of revolution, in a way. You have socialism, you have different forms of communist uprising, you have nationalist uprising. And Freud dreams that he's on a train with a figure who was a famous politician at the time called Count Thun. And Freud is um, being persecuted all of a sudden by this guy. And so he flees. Train stops. Freud gets off and he is on an academic campus. And Count Thun is still chasing him through this campus. And there's an interesting side point there, which is that why? Why the campus? Well, actually, it's because Freud himself was a Jewish scientist, and there was a kind of anxiety that he had apropos the kind of legitimacy of psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis within the academic space. Okay. Then he ends up back on the train station magically, and Count Thun is gone, but his father is there. But his father is a beggar, and he's peeing in, in a pathetic way into like some kind of receptacle in public. So he ends with a humiliated father. Mm -hmm interesting sequence of events. What's the point? Well, in a way, Freud basically says something around the necessity, because Count Thun was an aristocratic figure. It's not a left-wing figure. Freud said something about the interchangeability of the crisis of the necessity to stabilize the social situation from its possible revolutionary upheaval. It's necessary for this aristocratic figure to be the unhumiliated stand-in stabilizer, which is why a lot of commentators have basically said, yes, Freud's politics is around neutralization. You need a strong father, in other words, to stabilize the socio-symbolic, to keep everybody in order. Okay. And this is, this is the cornerstone of a certain way of reading Freud's conservatism. Okay. I'll stop there, but that's the basic story. What I was interested in with, um, you know, you bringing up Guattari, I was interested in the conclusion where you are re-envisioning the possibility for, say, communes, right, and experimental forms of families or living. And it made me think that one of the things, perhaps absent from anti-Oedipus, at least in theory, if not in formation, is something that Guattari tried to practice with you know, obviously with pros and cons, with successes and failures, with this notion of transversality, right, that he tried to implement experimentally in the Laborde clinic. Yeah. And, and I was thinking about how that type of, let's just say, experimentation that would sort of de-hierarchize and de-sediment people from divisions of labor that would be normally practiced, whether it be in the family, in the workplace, in other types of clinic, you know, destabilizing uh, relations of power and authority in ways that were at least theoretically healthier or, right. as I said, experimental. I wonder what, you know, do you see that as kind of going along with what you're, you, you were suggesting in the conclusion about these new types of communal mm -hmm. experimentations? Mm -hmm. Do you see something positive in that? Definitely. Definitely. I think... The grid, as he called it, right? Yeah, I definitely do. I think a couple things. One, we have a playbook. Going back to the utopian socialists, mm -hmm. up to the new left of these types of experimentation. One of the challenges is, I would say, twofold. The first is a political economic challenge which is how do you avoid what I call hypermarketization? Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that's interesting about the left and families is that rhetorically, and this I think is a beautiful point, actually, the most militant and radical leftist critiques of the family, historically capitalism has been able in a way to subsume them, has been able to kind of repackage the family with some of the ideas that the radical leftists bring into about. Case in point is this notion of the focus on adolescence. Mm -hmm. In part, that was a kind of radical leftist idea. 
Okay, that's so that's one one aspect. The second aspect would be can a commune structure satisfy to the extent, and I had this debate recently with a lot of family abolitionists, and it was an interesting thing that they had. I mean, I had a debate with folks, and I wanted the book to do this, mm -hmm. where they were saying, look, we need to fundamentally eradicate nuclear families. The father, as we know it, is a outcome of the nuclear family model. Okay, that needs to be abolished according to them. Okay. I think that, first of all, families are way pop more popular at the level of kind of democratic buy-in of just everyday people, irrespective of whether they can afford to have a family or not. People feel obliged to have families, which is why so many people have families and they get divorced. They, they don't really know what they're doing. They're trying to satisfy a kind of ancient yearning, as we know. Why are we drawn to the people that we love? These, 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 are, these are mysteries, you yeah? Psychoanalysis only gives us a kind of a few pointers in reality. So my question is this. It's a Girardian question in a way, in the sense of the mitigation or management of violence, in the sense that, okay, I think that family structures reproduce psychopathic violence internal to themselves. And I think that family structures become a question of organization and they become also the site where a lot of stuff is worked out, right? Like in a family, you are permitted in most cases, if not permitted, it definitely happens. It's a site of pure expression. In that sense, families already are sites of pure experimentation. It's like all of the unpermitted modes of action, of behavior, find their expression in the family. We already know that. It just so happens that it's limited in the bourgeois family because there's these two arbitrary figures that are the purveyors of that activity. But in a commune, there could be a whole set of other purveyors. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about a commune would be, okay, a social acting out, let's say acting out, right? Which is a natural constituent part of being a human and figuring out how to exist. What would that actually look like in such a way where you have a multiplicity of people to choose from, let's say, around the temporary need that you feel to have a fatherly figure? to work through certain dynamics that may emerge. I think that there's a certain flexibility there that could be quite interesting. And I also think that a commune experimentation form actually could be something that capitalism could not reproduce. Yeah. So in that sense, it's quite revolutionary from a political economic standpoint as well. So I think actually there's something there, you know? There's something there because, okay, how much longer can the private bourgeois family sustain itself? If that mechanism is the kind of centrifugal origin for the perpetuation of a consumer society which is eating the planet alive. How much longer can it persist? We know how attached we are to it. That's obvious. We don't know why we're attached to it exactly, but we know also that something is satiated in the process of having a family. There is a deeper, there is an initiatory process that occurs within the family. The, the crisis of the initiation though is such that it's no longer guaranteed. There's no kind of like procedure whereby it's, it's, it's given a sanction. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? In that sense, like no one is looking out for families anymore in a weird way, which is why to have a family today is a profound risk. It's a profound risk regardless of, regardless of how much money you have. It's, it's a fucking risk. So anyways, I don't know if this makes sense to you, but yeah, the commune thing is interesting. I, I mean, I only just touched on it. You know, I think a lot more research needs to go into this possibility. It could be quite something, though. I definitely think you're right about, you know, capitalism. It's not necessarily maybe antithetical to the commune form. It's that the, the commune form being replicable is, is something that is still to be seen within the, the hyper-marketization of everyday life, as you describe, and... And, you know, I, I think that a lot of the times this is kind of where movies, video games that where the, the dominant theme is post-apocalyptic societies, whether it be Fallout or, um, you know, games like this. I mean, Zizek, you know, obviously says it's easier to kind of imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Yeah, I guess that that's that's where uh, some I mean, you can see it in movies, but I was thinking about Fallout. You can see in some of these games where 
the communal life is more or less forced upon us rather than something that would grow out of a confrontation with with capitalism as you're pointing out right and and coop did you want to say something like tethered to this in terms of polyamory i was just wondering if that had if you had sort of considered that seems to be a rising that seems to be a trend over the last probably like what three three Mm -hmm. or four years i feel like I've been single for a long time. I've been off yeah. and on dating apps. And like, I noticed a profound increase in the amount of people that list themselves as polyamorous or, or like ethically non-monogamous and so forth. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. mean, as part of that, the fact that it takes four or five people to, you know, be able to pay for the, the means of, of living. You know, yeah. I mean, well, anyway. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think there's a political economic component to the polyamorous piece. I think that there is also a sense in which the satisfaction that is derived from the old kind of Fordist model, which is kind of frayed and kind of dying out of the nuclear family, is just simply no longer compelling to people for a variety of reasons. Not merely only because it's not affordable. It's not, it's not just that. It's, there's a series of other dynamics at play that I think also are related to the fact of sexualization. Like, in a way, it is paradoxical that in the era of neoliberalism, the family now is really seen by young people. You know that whole thing I was talking about, the ideology of the family spirit, which is the taboo on making explicit the fact that what occurs in the family is the receptacle of, you know, making the kind of engine work, right? It's where you're made into a good worker. It's where you act out all of your stuff so you don't act it out in society, right? It's where the family is, is that site that makes you into a well-integratable, you know, agent of, of human capital, right? That's a kind of monstrous fact for a family to, to live with and con- to, to contend with in a way. So it makes sense why the family would conceal that. I don't blame families for concealing that. It's not really imaginable but to conceal that, you know? So I think perhaps the polyamory thing is is a mode of experimenting beyond that. And maybe it is a sign of the indication that people are interested in finding alternative family structures in some way. But I also think that there's also some kind of um, sense in which I question the monogamous structure itself. I mean, there's something there also, which I haven't fully worked out. In part because, I mean, for me myself, I'm not, I have been married for over 15 years and I have two children. So myself, I'm not as um, in on these trends. So I can't really speak from personal experience too well. And I don't talk about it in the book. So I, I could kind of spit ball, but I, I'll, I won't do that. You probably would have better ideas about polyamory than me. So. I was going to say that, I mean, to me, I think I have a pretty feminist take on this, that the family is really like the site of, or like this, this covering over of domestic labor is, is like a, a continuation of like a of a appropriation of women's productive capacity, both in terms of their biological capacity to reproduce offspring, but also the unpaid wages of the household. Oh, yeah. But although yeah. now, like we have two breadwinner households now, so it's kind of like the woman is the woman's liberation to the the market has become an even more because now there's the second shift. As I forget who yeah. even coined the phrase or what have you. Right. But I don't know. It's like this. I think this family represents this sort of patriarchal, this legacy of patriarchal appropriation of the reproductive capacity of women. And there's a fear, a very pronounced fear, I think, of feminine jouissance yeah. in, our, in our culture. And maybe that has something to do with decoded flows. I don't know. I'm just sort of. Yeah. Well, but no, that's kind I of mean, the thoughts that are percolating in my head. Regarding no, I think, I think it's a good point. I will say there's also a paradox of the family, which is that because the family resolves a kind of grand mystery of one's own existential predicament, as it were, in the sense that it produces in a narcissistic way, as Freud knew, subjects in your likeness that Mm -hmm. continue the perpetuation of the saga of your kin. I mean, that's actually one of the things is kind of, you know, I think that all of us meditate on from time to time, which is, is ancestry. I mean, Nietzsche had that whole point that, you know, God is invented upon the forgetting of the ancestor. 
in a way, I feel that it's quite courageous to deny the act of engaging in a family on the one hand. On the other hand, it's equally courageous to forge a family today that would be opposed, explicitly politically opposed, and this would be a radicalization of the family, to the reproduction of the, nu- the old dead nuclear structure, which is no longer compelling, which no longer has any incentive, no longer has any stability, et cetera, et cetera. So there's two kind of wagers there you could do. One would be a refusal. The other would be sort of on my own terms. And I think maybe that second option, family as commune or family as something different, I would hope that young people might foster that. It does take a lot of courage, though, in my view, because I think part of what the neoliberal state relies on is this kind of disciplinary mechanism. So yes, they will kind of minimally assist families in need, but only minimally so. And it's why the side of the family is side of a lot of suffering, you know, in reality. So it's hard, no matter what, to have a traditional family, to not, or to go in a third way. Each one is difficult decision. It's not an easy decision to make. And sometimes it's not even a decision that's willed. Sometimes it's thrown on you. But it's so real because it's like the heart of, of um, as I said in the beginning, it's the heart of our political order. And that's why I wanted to write this book also, because it's like really a way to talk about things politically. I know we haven't had the Deleuze and Guattari thing, um, (laughs) conversation yet, but I mean, I I would, maybe in our, in our remaining time, we we could, if you you wanted to, we could chat about that. I wasn't going to try to force it. I know we're running low on time. I was thinking, this is kind of why I brought up transversality as, as for, uh, for broaching a different way of of thinking through, you know, communal experimentation and experimentation within and outside the family. Again, it's an ideal situation though. And it's something, you know, Guattari never, I mean, most of his time was struggling to get outside funding to keep this vision going. Oh, really? Um, Yeah. So, I mean, obviously today, one of the ways if Guattari wasn't a militant would be, you know, providing some sort of means of you know, advertisements and marketing labor, but obviously that would be antithetical to his way of doing things. You know, I would say there's something interesting that I, what I like is, is you do provide some instances where it is clear uh, they, Deleuze and Guattari, both kind of move away from the critique. In fact, a lot of what they dismiss in anti oedipus may not even be some of the theoretical solutions, but the mode of, pre- of presentation that even, uh, I was talking to Coop about this the other day, that even like when Marx was writing Capital and he's sending it, he's sending it off, he's writing letters to his correspondence and sending off drafts. And so much of what's coming back to him is, look, I've got a pretty good education. I have no fucking clue what you're talking about. So, <laughs> so, so, the, so the proletarians aren't going to, with the general education, aren't going to get it. And I think that that's one thing that Deleuze and Guattari, there was some other things too that they that they lamented, but, but yeah. definitely anti Oedipus is not something that is... Uh, that is easily approachable or for the lay person or even yeah. someone steeped in, in academia. And so I like that you were able to end your book with the Deleuze quote about, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter what you call it, your father, your mother, your grandmother, the familial structure or not, what matters is if there are exits. And I wanted to ask you about this pairing of a line of flight with a line of patience. Yeah. I actually don't think that that is antithetical to, especially what they will argue more in terms of a kind of caution and a turn, turns right. of, in terms of, uh, you know, don't territorialize, don't de, right. dra- don't de-stratify too quickly. So I was going to, in a spirit of like goodwill, I think that this notion of a line of patience with lines of flight, with it's, optional it, lines it, of flight yeah. has something resonant with, with the Liz and Guattari. And I, you want to say a little bit more about this notion of a line yeah. of patience as yeah. we, as we wrap yeah. up? I think that's a perfect point to home in on in our, in our remaining time. Okay. I feel a lot of it is interesting to me, apropos the conceptual framework of rhetorical investment mm-hmm. that political actors make of a body of work, a body of theory. And, there's that component. 
I think there's another component, which is, I feel like early Deleuze and Guatri did have a kind of wager that they threw down, that there is a kind of accelerationist wager mm -hmm. that we can kind of, you know, overcome certain contradictions of, of the capitalist system, which, you know, and then of course I give the, the reference to Bernard Stiegler, who I think interviewed Deleuze and I make a footnote of this incredible, mm -hmm. incredible insight that Stiegler recognized and that Deleuze confesses to, that there were aspects of the early work which needed to be modulated. And the modulation between flight versus patience, I was trying to say in the following, which is this. This is kind of one of the wages of the book. Maybe familial structures reproduce themselves within communes, reproduce themselves within revolutionary cells, and that that fact may be something we have to contend with. And if so, just like I say with the Mark Fisher between like Leninist superego and cultural conscious superego, that fact means that the left, which is who I wrote this book for, who I care about, like changing the society, et cetera, you know, we reproduce family structures and we live in a, we live in a highly Oedipalized society. As such, what is the kind of valence by which we use concepts to overcome that structure of negative dependence, mm -hmm. right? And not do so through a kind of libertarian structure. So that's another big thing for me, which is like, I do think, and you see a lot of commentators do point this out too, that yeah, you could take the and Guattari's early stuff and basically apply a libertarian piece to it and like have a successful vision of libertarian freedom produced there i.e. Nick Land. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's possible. Okay. Did they fortify the concepts adequately away from that? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. It doesn't really matter. What matters or what's more interesting is that you can use the, your concepts for socialistic ends or libertarian ends. That's interesting. Some Marxists would come back and say, well, like my good friend Harrison Fluss, for example, I know he would say, he's like, well, the listen quad three, you know, they're they're working with this kind of aristocratic Nietzschean thing, because I'm writing a book on Nietzsche. That's a whole other thing we've got to talk about in the future. But you say, well, that's a problem. And the other thing they would say is like, well, they can formulate a model of freedom for libertarians as well as for people on the side of liberty qua the left. Clearly, I'm saying the only way to read them has to be on the side of a left-wing model of emancipation. So anyways, there's something to that. But apropos patience, all I was trying to say is like, I think that there needs to be something like a kind of more patient return on the left because it's a big part of the left that doesn't give a you know what about working through the family about working mm. through questions of, they don't really care about that in fact what they really end up doing is either saying all that's going to be resolved after the revolution that's yeah. what fisher calls leninist superego or they say let's strengthen the family against capitalist precarity I think both of those things need to be kind of pushed against. And so I side with the socialist feminists, and that's what I call line of patience, which is let's work with the family as it is now, revolutionize it now. So I'm kind of doing a lot at once. I'm saying, let's do that. Let's revolutionize the family as it is now to kind of popularize a possible alternative because I was doing the family abolitionist event recently and they were saying, no, we just need a full negation of the family, full stop. And I said, well, what about ultra liberalism? What do I mean by ultra liberalism? Ultra liberalism is okay, abolish the police. Joe Biden can then get up there and basically support that. That's ultra liberalism, right? How do you fortify your rhetoric, your discourse, away from that liberal capture? And I know that Deleuze has a lot of concepts apropos avoiding capture that you would know better than me. So I think there's stuff that he, can, right? Does that make sense? Like there's a kind of do you agree with that, by the way? Like, I'm just curious. Like, It makes me think of, uh, I bring up this novel every now and then, but it makes me think of Brave New World. And Brave New World is this kind of dystopian, quasi-utopian future wherein the family is like, is that which has been dissolved. But it's a nightmare. And so it's easy to think that just abolishing the family is going to solve the problems that are, that are still, you, you know what I'm saying, that are still related to it. And this is kind of what you were getting at with reproducing familiar forms. Now, obviously in, in Brave New World, it's a work of fiction. So that has something going against it, but it still has, the, it still tries to deal with this narrative. Okay, 
So we've we've gone away from the family. We've gotten rid of Oedipus. We've gotten rid of sibling rivalry. And yet, even with the aid of this magical drug and these wild sex parties, and yet we still see that it's an even more insidious form of control. It's kind of Lacan's maxim that even if familial repression didn't exist, we would have to invent it. <laughs> exactly. So, it, you know, it, it is kind of... I think that that Huxley obviously is is semi ironic or at least somewhat ironic because he's like, okay, let's take Freud seriously and let's imagine this libidinal society, and we get rid of we get rid of uh, viviparous reproduction, right? So so everybody's born in little test tubes. There's no more appropriation of women's reproductive capacities. Everyone belongs to everyone else, right? This this kind of you know anti monogamy, anti anti-familialism, anti, but at the same time, reproduced even more strongly on a biological level, encoded in a biological level with the aid of different drugs in the embryogenesis process, you strengthen the hierarchies where you have like the super alphas versus the epsilons that are doing all the dirty work and everything in between where everybody's got their cast and their social harmony because, you know, as you kind of mentioned this uh when you bring up Deleuze's control society essay you know just because you've moved from a disciplinarian type of father familial structure to this control structure the problems shift and we still haven't necessarily done done away with Oedipus uh Mm. it's it's even more Mm. insidious it's even more I mean it's 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 also Zizek talking about the authoritarian father versus the the sort of liberal father uh, and yes. you, you point a, at, a, at a third option, which is you'll go to grandma's house and you'll enjoy it instead of it being, well, wouldn't you upset grandma if you didn't go think of how, think of how upset you would make her feel. It's like, right. it's like no, you're going to go and you're, you're going to enjoy it, which is obviously distinct from the disciplinary father who says, you're well, going because I said yeah. so. Well, that's, that's the whole basis of Zizek's perverse subject of late capitalism, which, mm-hmm. is, yeah. which is that the father's gone, the mother's there. But the mother's injunction back to the subject is that you have to internalize the demand. Yeah. This is well known by now. And that internalization conceals and also kind of invents a phallic object, which must be disavowed. Let me just say a couple things about that. One, that is terrible. I don't think that we're fully... It invites humor. It's humorous that structure, but the idea that a perverse subjectivity would be ubiquitous or that it would be common. If you really like think about actually its function, you think about its structure, you think about its mechanism, its relay system, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry to say, but it's like really nightmarish. And when you see it in other people, when you see in other people, the tendency, I'll just say a couple of tendencies. When you see the tendency of your loved ones, let's say, to derive or to, to only speak about and gain satisfaction around when they speak about the suffering of others, for example, or when they speak about the normaliza- normal scenarios as necessitating suffering others, right? As constitutive parts of that normality. This is perverse subjectivity. I've been thinking a lot about how we might puncture that perverse subject structure, because to me, it's something that should never be normalized. It should be abolished. That cannot continue. We can kind of dance around it and kind of point it out. And it's a structure of humiliation. It's a structure of humiliation and shame. You know what I mean? And this is what Lacan called the capitalist discourse. He basically said, and he showed in television and then in the Milan discourse, that, you know, it kind of goes back to social superego as well, the whole theme. Our society is producing these conditions of a perverse subjectivity, also of a psychotic subject. But I think what's even more common is this perverse piece. Psychotic is there, you know, the schizophrenic piece is there. But anyways, I'll stop there. I'm just saying it's like it just, do you find it, Cooper or or Taylor, like kind of ingratiating when you see that kind of formation in people, when you see it come about? Does that make sense? Does it bother you or am I alone on that? No, no. I, I mean, I just think about there's so much with the recent announcement that, you know, I don't see anything coming of it, but the recent announcement of that, you know, Biden's talking with the House Democrats and 
you know, a plan to, to do away with student debt. And so you see this discourse comes around every few weeks where there's just a lot of people who, who want to say they play by the rules and no one else should, should have it easy, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, you, you see this discourse of my enjoyment is, should come at the expense of, of others suffering. You see that kind of discourse. I'm sure we could generalize it to a lot of other things. I don't know if Cooper has his own response. Yeah. I mean, I I would just point to Daniel's own post about, was it Laura Ingram that recounted the story about her 73 year old mother was paying her student loans or something. That was an interesting post. I mean, apropos of the family there, Laura Ingram said, my Mm -hmm. mother worked till she was 73 to pay off, to help pay off my loans. And that's playing by the rules. What's interesting about that is that first of all, nobody ever said the rules are to work to your 73 and pay off loans. No one ever said that. Those are not accepted rules, number one. Number two, notice the necessity that the mother, not the father, ha, 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 yeah. bear, bear the brunt of that toil right? without question. And that, that actually be extended. That, to me, is sin qua non of a, of a, a situation of perversion. Speaking of, uh, apropos class, it's also interesting to me in the sense that that actually signifies also that the ideal, because she is speaking about a norm. She's making a norm. She said rule. She's talking about a norm. Check this out. What's the norm? Ah, the norm is not the bourgeois norm of, what's the bourgeois norm? This is why, this is why Frankfurt School said there's elements of bourgeois family that are worth retaining. Because a bourgeois norm was no work for a woman. Right? No work that's considered work. <laughs> no work that's considered work, right? But de- de- definitely not. Of- definitely not this. Definitely yeah. not the degradation of wage labor. There's a certain, and this is why actually Stiegler, Bernard Stiegler, is a very controversial idea, which is that the super ego deprivation that I spoke of earlier, you know, of late capitalism, etc. That in fact we need to like go back and like reinvent some kind of s- different super egoic tethering yeah. so that people can start to formulate a different form of self-love. Yeah. So he actually takes the thesis kind of like Kernberg, which Lash is working with. And he says, you know, the problem with late capitalism is, is that this is what he calls the new barbarians. The new barbarians and Laura Ingram is definitely a new barbarian is that deep down they're in such a tormented psychic state that they actually have no narcissism. And here we have to return to Freud's distinction between primary and secondary narcissism. Mm-hmm. They have a stunted form of primary narcissism. They haven't passed its way through that dialectic. And as such, we need to create the conditions, which is a super egoic question. And this is a big debate for creating fostering conditions such that people like Laura Ingram would actually be able to see the status of mothers, let's say, beyond this kind of perverse, cruel individualist structure. I don't know how you do that, but I think theoretically it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think something like big socialist politics, by the way, are like at the center of that reinvention of a superego. Much more to be said about that. Yeah, we can wrap up. I mean, I think we've got a lot here. Cooper, I didn't want to leave you without potentially having the last question, but I do think that that's, that's a good place for us to to sort of end on and it we've kind of provided the context and the the reason behind why we should read your work and i am interested in, in your future work on, on nietzsche as well yeah um, but i hope that if any of the conversations we've we've been having you know spark some interest and and some reflection i think I, I definitely recommend taking a look at daniel's book on psychoanalysis in the family the crisis of initiation is that correct yeah and that's the subtitle, yeah. Which, uh, yeah, exactly. Psychoanalysis and the politics of the family. There you go. That's right. Thank you. But yeah, gentlemen, no, it's been good. I think we um, we covered the book very, very well. Thank you both for for contending with the arguments and uh, having me <laughs> on. And uh, of course, it was fun, man. It was uh, it was enjoyable. It was very enjoyable. We loved having you on uh, last time to help think through anti Oedipus. So it is kind of interesting for it to to come full circle <laughs> yeah, right. and to and to be able to see maybe a little bit of what we discussed 
I wouldn't say inspired, but maybe it, it helped go into the writing of this work. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. definitely. It did actually. No, because it was around that time where I was writing aspects of the chapter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You had posted you're working on that book, and I was like, hey, yeah. you should hop in with us. That's right. Yeah. I think at yeah. The time. yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, and and yeah, I mean, the Nietzsche book will be fun. I mean, the new Marxist critique of Nietzsche is the current title with repeater books. So it's not an academic press. My vision here is to introduce people to like a, a different way of reading Nietzsche mm-hmm. um, for Marxists, uh, which is not easy to do. I mean, not easy to do on many levels, on the, but but it's it's a great exercise to do it. Because Nietzsche is such a sort of such a significant figure, so contending with Nietzsche is like some of the most meaningful intellectual activity that one can do. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what you all think. I'm kind of bringing a bunch of Marxist critiques of Nietzsche or views on Nietzsche, which kind of haven't hit the mainstream yet for various reasons. And I will just say one thing, which is that I'm not, I'm not extremely dismissive of Nietzsche. I actually think that Nietzsche is not somebody, even though he has these radical politics, aristocratic politics, I think that it's too shallow to simply dismiss him as a result of those things. Yeah. I'm not trying to do that. It's much more of a complex picture that I'm trying to construct. Like, I literally think that Nietzsche teaches us a shitload that, like, Marxists and socialists need to contend with. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm going to be real with the legacy of Nietzsche. I'm not going to be, like, too dismissive. Just I'm going to jump on the bandwagon. Well, there is a tendency now after Lacerdo's book and like, yeah. I'm not going to do that whole thing. I mean, I'm going to take it seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, although, you know, it's really interesting, like Jacques Donzelo, who in his work on anti-Oedipus really does emphasize how, how Nietzsche, Nietzscheanism was, is a part of the Deleuze and Guattari. Oh yeah. Period. It's an important part. And of course, you know, there's uh, Jan Raymond's. I'm going to have Jan Raymond on my podcast soon. I don't know if you've heard of this guy. No? No. He has this book on um, postmodern Nietzscheanism, which is a look at Foucault and Deleuze and their reading of Nietzsche. And um, he's quite critical. He basically takes Lucerto's methodology, but he applies it to like the theory, the, f- the philosophy. And um, about halfway through it right now, it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting. Yeah. I might write a review. I mean, it's going to be in the book that I write about as well. In our final time, let me just ask you guys, are you guys big Nietzschean admirers? Or are you kind of on the fence? I think Taylor much more than I. Although, I think I'm like, Sterner is kind of my own yeah, Sterner, sort of problematic. Sterner's your Nietzsche. Yeah. Sterner, Sterner's your Nietzsche. I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to Nietzsche pill. Uh, yeah, and I'm trying to Sterner pill Tyler, yeah. or Taylor. So, long story short, I definitely admire Nietzsche. I think he's, uh, you know, he's, and he's important for understanding post-World War II French oh, yeah. philosophy. And he's an important thinker in his own right. I think that he's going to continue to have an influence. And I just think that I do agree with someone like Ray Brazzi, who said, like, I could have become a Nietzschean and just read Nietzsche because he, I always enjoyed it so much. And he said, I, well, that's not necessarily what a thinker does. You can't, you can't just eat uh, candy, right. And have a healthy like diet. Right? Yeah. You have, you have to be able to call your own preconceptions into, into, into right. question. So I think that that's part of, because especially, you know, a lot of people get into Nietzsche when they're in their, their teens and you are, you're, you're rebellious and you're, you're yeah. moody and all these other things. And, uh, and so it does going back to Nietzsche when he says, like, if you want to follow me, you have to lose me. I mean, it is being critical of not only of Nietzsche's ideas, but of, of our own kind of why do they still have this seductive influence over us? Yeah. And, and we have yeah. to we have to be we have to become aware of that and and be able to articulate reasons why, hey, you know, he's you know, he still has something to say. Given all of that, there is still something productive and engaging right. with his thought. I totally agree. I mean, yeah, it's like a, um, if Nietzsche is the unsurpassable uh, motivation for the preservation of a kind of unsurpassable hyper-individualism, if Nietzscheanism is, at the end of the day, what unites the right, the left, the center, you name it, into a project for the continuation of a type of Western... The The monumental... Precisely a kind of 
what Jeff Waite calls the paradox between the exo and esoteric of Nietzscheanism. In other words, if the concepts of Nietzscheanism, in a true sense, like are weapons, if they really are weapons, and this is kind of my book, right? This is like my book. Like, if they really are weapons, well, what effect do they have on us as weapons? Do they, do they puncture? Do they wound in a kind of existentialist, you know, post-war social superego hedonist structure? Or is Nietzscheanism also taken up as Lukács thought it was, which was a particular form of philosophy that was meant, according to Lukács, to mitigate the rational validity of class struggle. By me saying that, any Nietzschean in this audience would be like, oh, fuck you, man. There's no way that we could say that. Ah, but then you have to look historically, and actually that is how Nietzscheanism did work in some times. You see my point? Yeah. There's a history there. You see what I'm saying? There's a history of how Nietzscheanism interacts with Marxist dialectics and Hegelian dialectics, which we need to kind of work through. So that's kind of what I want to write about, you know, is that history. And being honest with what Nietzscheanism does when Nietzscheanism becomes in the field of politics. What does it do? What's its function? And if Nietzsche can be read, if there is a center to Nietzsche, it can be conceived of, can be comprehended from a Marxist position. In a way, my argument would be that that kind of ruins Nietzsche. Because like that actually ends, like that doesn't cancel him. It just kind of makes like, everything intelligible. And that's like the last thing he wanted. He actually wanted to be elusive and unpin-downable in mm -hmm. a certain way. You know what I mean? So anyways, does that make sense? Yeah, that's kind of my that's kind of my approach is to sort of take him seriously as a political figure. And like what the hell that means. Larwell calls Nietzsche a political machine. So <laughs> so yeah, Larwa has that whole thing that's like he goes through fascism to overcome he like destroys yeah, yeah. fascism. It's crazy. Like Yeah, he 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 uh he embraces fascism to the better to smother it and drown it and stuff like that. Yeah. It's it calls into question all of our uh presuppositions about Nietzsche, whether left or right. So I think that that, exactly. that sounds like something that, that you're trying to do in your own way. And I, I totally applaud that. Uh yeah. you, were, you were gonna say something. Maybe I was gonna ask what text that is in. Which one? Laruel. Uh, the Laruel that you just mentioned. Yeah. That's just a little fragment of the introductory chapter to his Nietzsche contra Heidegger, which is a, uh, which I, I put a translation up before we, you and I started hanging out. I could send it nice. to you. Somewhat neat in a Nietzschean hyperbolic provocative way, he says this kind of thing where Nietzsche is playing off the master against the rebel and vice versa. And so for there to be a, a left Nietzsche or right Nietzsche is, is actually not to like read him correctly. He calls it a, a political machine, and uh, Marx does figure prominently too in that book. I hope at some point it gets it gets translated, but you know, you never know with uh, Larwell. You know my feelings about this. He's a lot of the books have come out in strange order. He's been written off, you know, by Zizek and Badu. As I don't really blame them. Some of the translations are not really in a in a good state for the English reader in any case so that doesn't help with the reception but i do think that's a it's an interesting early work of his that shows uh the importance of not only nietzsche but deleuze and derrida's nietzsche too for larwell's project it's a cool little chapter yeah. sounds interesting you might have to take a look at that sometime i'll just say this i think that french nietzscheanism makes of nietzsche's politics something different than how they were made of prior to the second world war and I think that it's important that we retain a memory of what Nietzsche was, what Nietzscheanism was done with politically before the war, because it wasn't pretty. I mean, the destruction of metaphysics, right, and Nietzscheanism and its celebration of Ubermensch was used by the Nazis. And that's like, a, that's a fact on the one hand. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that we need to cancel him. It just means that like, there's a legitimate pass that occurred. On the one hand, and then and then another point is like you know, it's interesting to read Gramsci on Nietzsche. Anyways, I I don't want to get into all this stuff, but there's so much, there's so much that we 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 need to have a whole thing on like maybe maybe like an episode on Nietzsche and the left. I would love to. Oh yeah, all about that. Yeah, yeah. As you as you get further into your your work, 
Hell yeah. That'd be great. That'd be great to, to have you come back on and, and discuss that. We're really thankful for you to, to come on to talk about your book today. And Hell yeah. you're always welcome to come back. It's, it's always good to see you. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And I appreciate the time. And I hope that, um, I hope this made us think about families a little bit differently, maybe. <laughs> open, open up some kind of, yeah, you know? Some kind well, of, I, I woke up like, terrified one morning because I realized, you know, I'm going to get old and there's going to be nobody to take care of me. So <laughs> it made me have an existential crisis this week, one day, but that's okay. I overcame, I I overcame it. The very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is this is a typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. What I meant is the following. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a clockwork orange.